Well, that is such a simple song, but it's so true. So true, Sandra. Thank you. As we begin today, you can turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. And as you've read your Bible and prayed every day, I'm sure you've come across this passage before. Luke chapter 24, we're going to start in verse 13 today. Let's begin with prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you for your son. Thank you that we can come to you and pray and that we can read your word and that you promise that we will grow, not necessarily vertically, but we will grow spiritually and intellectually and emotionally and mentally in all sorts of wonderful ways. We pray that as you open up your scriptures to us this morning, that your Holy Spirit would teach us and guide us. And as we've asked many times in the past, we ask again that you would open your scriptures to us, that you would open our hearts to what we need to understand, that you would open our ears to what we need to hear, and you would open our eyes to what we need to see. Lord, I ask that you would use me as your mouthpiece. Would you let words, only words that you want spoken to be heard? We thank you for this amazing day. We thank you for each one here. We just ask that you would bless the remainder of their day, Lord, as we bless you this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So a couple of weeks ago, we had come to the darkest chapter in Jesus' life, and quite literally, one of the darkest days in all of history. As, this, as Jesus died, the sun went black, and there was darkness so thick that you could feel it between noon and 3 p.m. But then three days later, the brightest day in history took place, and life itself in Jesus Christ walked out of the tomb, and he left it vacant permanently. Because of that, you and I get to enjoy eternal life with him as well. And so we walked through the darkest chapter and then the lightest chapter in the last couple of weeks, and now we're going to see some of the aftermath of that. We read last week, I read for you out of a devotional that I've been doing and actually really enjoy. We read why Jesus lingered. Why did he stick around? I mean, he'd already conquered death. What else was left for him to do? And yet he stuck around for 40 days after rising from the grave. And we have a few accounts of the things that he did during those 40 days. And today we're going to re read about some of those events. And then I would just like to, I guess, make it clear that we only have one more sermon left after this in this series. And we'll be wrapping up the life of Christ. Um, I hope it didn't feel too long for some. It was well over a year that it took us to do the life of Christ. And I think we're going to continue on through the New Testament to go forward. Um, but that being said, we'll be referring back to the Old Testament for our context as well. So, without further ado, Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 13. The same day, so this is Resurrection Sunday, probably in the afternoon, Two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. These men were disciples of Jesus, and as you and I do when we've suffered a great loss, we tend to come together and talk about what happened. We need to process it. These two men needed to process what had just happened they had witnessed maybe Jesus being arrested, and then they fleed and left him alone, and then they realized, hey, he's been crucified brutally, and he's in a grave. Jesus' female disciples had come to them and told them, Jesus is alive. And these two men had completely disregarded what they said. 
So they're grieving. They're trying to process the loss of this man who claimed to be the Messiah, this man who had not only befriended them, but treated them like family for three and a half years. This man who had done amazing miracles. He'd brought people back from the dead. And yet they are in grief because they believe that he is still in his tomb. Verse 15. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. I think this is a pretty neat picture. I mean, Jesus had said in Matthew 18, verse 20, wherever two or more are gathered in my name, there I will be also. And here you have two gathered in his name, and he appears with them. This is a neat picture because although two or more of us often gather and we don't see that Jesus is walking right beside us, he is. Just because we can't see him standing there doesn't mean that his presence is not there. And I think he's physically demonstrating that here. And I love that he shows up and they don't recognize him immediately, but he walks with them and he talks with them. Verse 16, but God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened here in the last few weeks. Now this just tells me that the Holy Spirit has a sense of humor. You must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about these things. He was the one who knew about them the best. Verse 19. What things? Jesus asked. And we'll just pause there for a second. Why do you think God kept these two men from recognizing Jesus? I mean, they are grieving, and it would have been very soothing for their souls to be able to see that he was walking right beside them and talking with them. He was fully alive. All is well. I mean, that would have given them abundant joy, right? Well, I believe that God has a couple of honesty, a couple of reasons for keeping these men from knowing who Jesus is right off the bat. One, I believe it's to keep them honest. Do you think Cleopas ever would have said that Jesus was the only person in Jerusalem who didn't know about these things if he knew he was talking to Jesus face to face? No. But Cleopas was being honest. He was being raw, right from the heart. And I think if he would have recognized Jesus, he may have hesitated and, and chosen his words a lot more carefully. I think he may have even said words that weren't necessarily true in order to try and say what Jesus wanted to hear, if that makes sense. But he doesn't recognize Jesus, so he's just blunt and honest. He's raw about what he's feeling. And that's what Jesus wants. I want you to be honest with me. I think the second reason is Jesus doesn't want these two men, and you could say he doesn't want us, to only recognize him by sight. As we seen last time in our conclusion to the last message, we are to have faith by hearing the good news of Christ, not by seeing it. And so they can't see him. They don't recognize him. But he begins to teach them and talk with them. And he does that so that they will recognize their shepherd's voice. And soon they will know exactly who he is. But he wants them to recognize him by faith and not by sight because he knows that he's leaving soon. In 40 days, he will ascend into heaven and he won't be there anymore. So they will have to grow accustomed to listening to his voice and listening for his voice rather than seeing him face to face. That would be quite the transition to make. I mean, you and I are going to experience that in reverse. If you've been a follower of Jesus Christ, you've listened to his voice for as long as you've believed in him. And one day we'll get to see him face to face. These disciples are experiencing the exact opposite. They've seen him face to face for three and a half years, and they're going to have to get used to listening for his voice. 
He wants them to get used to what he's revealing about himself with their ears. And Jesus is about to do one more thing, something that I wish I could have been there to listen to. He's going to reveal himself in all of the scriptures, starting with Moses and walking all the way through the prophets, the writings of wisdom, all of that. He's going to explain all of it to his disciples. What a conversation that must have been. So in verse 19 or 18, they had asked uh, or told Jesus that he hadn't heard about the things that have been happening the last few days, not knowing that it was him they were talking to. And Jesus replies, what things? I can picture a smirk on his face when he's asking that. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did wonderful miracles. He was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped that he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. And all of this happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing. And they said they had seen angels that told them Jesus was alive. Some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Just notice in verse 24, the disciples are referring to Jesus in a past tense, not a present tense. They're referring to him as if he's still dead, as if he's long gone. And they had completely disregarded what the women who had seen the empty tomb had reported to them. See, all of their lives, they were raised in Jewish homes with Jewish religion under Jewish scriptures, which we would call our Old Testament. And they had come to expect a glorious king. What they got was a crucified king. They didn't realize that Jesus is coming again in his glory later. I mean, we haven't even seen that yet. But they were expecting a glorified king, and they got a crucified king. They expected the Lion of Judah to come and conquer Rome and bring justice to the world and set up his kingdom forever. And what they got was the Lamb of God, who was slain for sins for the entire world. This is not what they expected. They expected him not to get killed at all. And the last time most of them had seen him, he was being arrested and led away to die. Verse 25. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people. And I don't believe he said that with hate in his voice or um, frustration. I believe that he said that out of compassion for them that they just did not understand their scriptures you foolish people you find it so hard to believe all the prophets wrote in the scriptures all of it wasn't it clearly predicted that the messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory and if you read through the old testament carefully you will find that everything that jesus went through including his death his beating and his resurrection is clearly predicted in the Old Testament. I think it goes to show that the disciples and their theology was based on things that they chose to believe here and there out of the scriptures. They had Dalmatian theology. They took this spot and they took this spot and they took this spot, the things that they like and the things that make sense and the rest of it can just, uh, that's all white stuff that can stay off to the side and I don't understand that, or it doesn't seem relevant to me, so I'm just going to forget about it. But Jesus is making it clear to them, this was all prophesied that it was going to happen, yet you're having a hard time actually believing what God told these prophets to write down for you to know. And I think I make the same mistake sometimes. When I come across something in the Bible that seems hard to believe, I just 
kind of put it on the shelf. Verse 27. Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. See, the problem was that they didn't believe all of the scriptures. They believed some, they believed portions and spots, like we discussed. But Jesus placed a very high value on the entire word of God. In fact, during his ministry in these four Gospels that we've been reading out of for the last year, and more than that, he quotes the Old, Test Old Testament 64 times. He quotes from and or alludes to 27 different Old Testament books. So Jesus had a love for all of Scripture. He quoted from all of God's word. He held it at the highest value. So what you're seeing here happening on the road to Emmaus is a conversation that was a Bible study with Jesus himself. Best Bible study ever. You would never find one better. There's no better teacher. Bible study with Jesus himself. He started poss possibly with Genesis 3.15 as he explained God's curse on the serpent and on mankind. He explained that the woman would bear a seed that would crush the head of the serpent. He would have explained through the laws of Moses and carried on through the story of Abraham, the various fulfillments of sacrifice through Old Testament law, referring back to passages like Psalm 2, Psalm 22, Isaiah 9 that predicted his birth, Isaiah 53 that predicted his death, and everything in between. He explained it all. Can you imagine the Messiah himself unlocking the Old Testament for you? What an amazing conversation. I often wish that I was a fly on somebody's tunic for that conversation. In fact, I have a resource for you. If you've ever wished that you could unlock some of the things that, what did the Old Testament mean? How is it referring to the Messiah? I don't understand the Old Testament. I don't understand how the whole Bible refers to Jesus. Well, on the next slide, I'd like to offer you a resource. I bumped into this about six months ago. It's a three-part series called The Mystery of Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. It's uh, by Thomas Horn, Donna Howell, and Ali Anderson, and you can find it on skywatchtv.com. But if you are serious about your own personal Bible study, if you want to know more about Jesus, not just from the four Gospels or just from the New Testament, but if you want to know him from the Old Testament, from the New Testament, and through that very challenging book we call Revelation, then I would suggest you order this series. Um, I, I'm not much of a reader without audio to go with it, and I still powered through this entire three book series in about two months. I couldn't put it down. Um, so if you have questions about who Jesus is in the Old Testament, um, I think this is as close as you're going to get to the conversation on the Emmaus Road that I've ever found. So if that interests you and you have more questions for me, I'd be happy to help you out finding that resource if you would like to have it. Verse 28. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus at the end of their journey. Jesus acted if, as if he were going on, but they begged him, stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with them. I think this just goes to show that Jesus is never, ever going to force himself to be invited into your life. He waited for these two gentlemen to invite him into their place that they were staying to stay with them. He didn't go say, say go, surprise, it's me, the Messiah, and I want to come in with you. I'm coming in to eat with you tonight. Uh, make, make room for me, please. And he doesn't do that in our lives either. Jesus will never force his way into your heart. 
or your life. He's given you and I the decision whether we accept him in or not. And he will always respect that decision. He wants to come in. He wants you to know him. He wants fellowship with you. He died for that reason. There's nothing he wants more. But he won't force it on you. Verse 30. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. Another case of God's sense of humor. He breaks the bread just as like he had done on that first communion on the Thursday night before he was betrayed. He breaks the bread and he blesses it. And the disciples just, wow, it's Jesus. He's, he's right here. Hi, guys. Bye. Poof, gone. I think that's God's sense of humor right there. But he does come back. He does appear to them again. Then they said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? Notice that scriptures do not say, didn't our hearts burn when we looked at him, when we saw him? No, because faith is not by sight. And they didn't say, didn't our hearts burn inside of us when we spoke to him? No. And I think that should speak to our prayer lives that we don't get to do all the talking when we pray. We should be listening for God's answer too. Scripture says, their hearts burned inside of them when they listened to him explain the scriptures to them. Faith is not by sight. Faith is by hearing the good news. And we have faith in the voice of our shepherd. They were listening to the word of God. The word of God is described in John 1.1 1, 1 as in the beginning, the word was with God and the word was God. The word of God itself had explained the scriptures to these men. And I know I keep repeating that, but if you really think about it, what an amazing conversation that would have been. Imagine the kind of things that these two men went on to teach and how they shared the gospel with people. It would have been incredible to listening, listen to these men. Um, and in fact, if any one of them ever want to come and fill the pulpit here, more than welcome. I know they're not here. Let's turn to John chapter 20. And we'll just have a few verses there. And then we'll conclude. John chapter 20, we're going to start in verse 19. John twenty nineteen. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Shalom, he said. Peace be with you. His first word to the disciples that had deserted him ran away and let him be tortured and killed. His first word was not, I can't believe you deserted me. His first words were not, you are a bunch of losers and you're really bad friends. I mean, he had every right to say that, but he didn't. His first word to them in Hebrew was shalom. And this is one of the main reasons that during VBS and other kids' times, I've wanted the kids to know that word, shalom, the shalom of Yeshua, the peace of Jesus be with you. Because we're all going to make mistakes in our Christian walk. We're all going to have times where we feel like we've deserted God and, and left him on his own, which he's perfectly fine on his own. He doesn't need us. But we will feel like we've walked out on our faith or walked out on God or betrayed him in some way. And I want to remind you and myself 
during those times when we're back in his presence and we seek him again, his first words to you are, Shalom. Peace be with you. Verse 20, as he spoke, he showed them the wounds on his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So this is a commission. He's telling them, I was sent by the Father to bring the good news to planet Earth. Now you are going to take my place when I'm gone, and you're going to do the same thing. I'm sending you out to share the gospel with others. We are to take Jesus' place here on Earth, where we are his body in Scripture. His Holy Spirit is our helper and will guide us as we do that. So we are to take his shalom to the rest of the world. We have peace with God because of Christ. Because, or because you, were, you and I were born into sin, when we were in that state, we did not have peace with God. There was no being in God's company or being in his family. We were at odds with God. But Jesus has reconciled us to God, and because of that, we now have peace with God. We can also have the peace of God, now that we have peace with God. Does that make sense? The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, is a part of of receiving the Holy Spirit. You can enjoy his peace, and many of you can attest to this in some of the most brutal times of your life. If you've known Jesus as your friend, as your savior, there's been times where life has fallen apart, yet he's washed over you with his peace, and then you look back and you go, wow, I don't know how I got through that, except for the peace of God. So that is true shalom. Verse 22, then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. Thomas, in scripture, kind of reminds me of Eeyore. You know Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh, the donkey. He's always got that little bit of a bummed out attitude, but he's also very, very honest. At one point in his ministry, Jesus had said, I believe it was, let's go up to Caesarea Philippi. That was with the place where the gates of hell were. You know, that really, really scary demonic place that Jesus went to. You remember Thomas's response to that was, oh, sure, let's go and die with them while we're at it. Now, that sounds like Eeyore, doesn't it? It's a little depressing, but, you know, at least he's honest. So Thomas was nicknamed the twin. <laughs> but who is his twin? Maybe it's you or me. It's an interesting thought that Skip Heitzig brought up. Maybe I'm a twin with Judas. Maybe sometimes, well, more than sometimes, I have my doubts and my fears. We're going to see here in a minute that Judas will say, or sorry, not Judas, Thomas will say, I won't believe that Jesus has risen from the dead until I've seen him face to face and I've put my finger where the holes are in his wrists, in his hands. I won't believe it till I see it. How many of us have done the same thing? God says, I'll be with you. I promise I'll, believe, I'll be with you. I promise I will give you my shalom. And you go, yeah, right. I'll believe that when I see it. I've been there. I've been there. Let's keep reading, though. The story turns around. Verse 25. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I, have, I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and the place and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples gathered again. 
So for eight days, they had to hear Mr. Eeyore, I won't believe it till I see it. I won't believe it till I see it. Show me, prove it to me for eight days. And this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked and suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Shalom, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound on my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Now that is quite the statement of faith. Thomas went from, I won't believe it till I see it, to my Lord and my God. And he did it that fast. That is proof that those who have not recognized Jesus' voice and not taken him as Lord, when they do see him face to face on judgment day, they will realize this is God Almighty. There is no denying that. I see that now. And I know that to the fullest. But Thomas makes this incredible statement of faith, and he's absolutely right. Jesus is his Lord and his God. But you see, Thomas had missed out on the joy that the other disciples had had for the previous eight days because he wasn't there. See, they were all happy and excited because they had seen Jesus face to face. They knew he was alive, but Thomas missed out for eight days. Unfellowshipped believers miss out on a lot. If you're not regularly in fellowship with other believers, and yes, that includes coming to church, but I mean regular fellowship, church, getting together for meals, doing things as friends, participating in community events, being with your own family in fellowship. If you're not fellowshipped, it hurts your soul and it robs your joy. Hebrews 10.25 says, And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. You remember that during the pandemic, lots of people left the pews very vacant. And we were pushed quite hard not to gather in church. It was interesting that uh, liquor stores and cannabis shops were still open. That wasn't a problem to be there. But to come to church, hmm, that was, uh, I don't want to get into the weeds too much on that one, but a lot of believers struggled with, with that after the pandemic, and many still are. It just became more comfortable to sit at home and flip on YouTube and find the sermon you like the best and watch that, and there's your Sunday morning. Bedside Baptist, here we go. Easy, right? And it is easy, and it's comfortable. But one thing you lack from church on TV is fellowship with the people around you. And as you've been in church, you may notice that your, your social life, your level of joy increases as you fellowship with other believers. Believe it or not, we don't do potlucks here for the food. I mean, it's really, really good, and I won't argue with that, but we do potlucks for the fellowship to keep each other together after church and let's have a visit. Let's share with each other what the Lord has been doing in our lives lately. I mean, that should be the main conversation around the table at a potluck. So that's why we fellowship. Verse 29. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. None of us in this room have seen Jesus face to face. If you have, I want your autograph. But we haven't seen him face to face. Yet there are so many in this room, if not everyone in this room, that believe him and trust him and know him as their savior. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Jesus has blessed you for that faith. He's blessed you for believing in him without seeing him. So when it's really tough and you wish you could see him, hold on to this. He's blessed you for your faith. 
The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. What a beautiful blessing. I would like to just add that Thomas began the evening as Eeyore, but he ended it as Tigger. Full of joy, maybe even bouncing around the room, we don't know. But all of that is because Jesus showed up. You and I can experience that same joy because Jesus has actually showed up in your life as well. Maybe you haven't seen him face to face, but if you know the Holy Spirit, you know the presence of Jesus. You've experienced that. Jesus definitely showed up. He showed up to give his life for all of us, and he showed up three days later completely alive to offer us eternal life. It's pretty amazing. Well, let's just see what we can take away from today. I, I have four points written down here. Three of them made, them made it into your bulletin this morning on the back. But uh, I had a reminder this morning um, that I had to add in. So number one, the disciples were slow to know they only believed certain pieces of what the Old Testament prophets wrote. They didn't believe all of it. Maybe they didn't even understand all of it, but they certainly didn't believe all of it. Are we the same way sometimes? As Pastor Skip Heitzig says, slow to know is slow to grow. We heard from Sandra today and the children, read your Bible and pray every day and you will grow, grow, grow. And it's very, very true. But if you only pick and choose the certain pieces of your Bible that you like or the pieces that you understand or the pieces that make your heart all warm and fuzzy, that will limit the amount that you can grow. Some of the most challenging things in Scripture are the things that help us grow the most. For example, I don't like hearing that I'm a sinful, broken, fallen human being that is destined to spend eternity in hell if I don't accept Christ. That's not exactly bringing me warm and fuzzies. But it's the truth, and it's that very truth that changed my life and yours to accept Christ. So knowing all of the scriptures is so important to our growth as Christians. Let's not have Dalmatian theology. If Jesus held the scripture as the word of God, and yet we only believe certain spots to be true, how can we be certain that anything else Jesus said was true? And what about salvation? What about heaven and hell? If we only be, believe pieces of what he said, can we trust that all of those things are real? This is, in fact, the very reason that we've been going through the Gospels and the Scriptures in somewhat of a chronological order. I mean, it started way back when we did that overview series of the entire Bible. And then we kind of circled back and zeroed in on the life of Jesus Christ. And this is exactly why we do that. We want to focus on the things that God said and has taught us, and we want to focus on all of it so that we understand his word and we understand him better. It'll bring you joy, a lot of joy, and a lot of peace, and a lot of growth. Number two, Jesus, just as Jesus had intended to go past Emmaus, he wasn't going to stay, but he accepted the disciples' invitation instead, he will never force your way into his way into your life. You see, Jesus is the perfect gentleman. He'll never force his way in. But he eagerly awaits your invitation. He will stand at the door and knock, and he will come in to be with whoever lets him in. But he will also stay out of your life if that's what you want. He will respect that decision. But let me just leave you with a question. Is life without Jesus really a life at all? No. 
Number three, John 1.1 1, 1 says that in the beginning, the word already existed. The word being Jesus. The word was with God and the word was God. The hearts of the disciples burned within them as they listened to Yeshua, the word, explain old and familiar truths with a new application. They were excited as Jesus explained the scriptures bit by bit to them. And maybe for the first time in their whole lives, it started to burn within them and come alive. And that is exactly what the Holy Spirit's work is in your heart. It's to bring the scriptures alive to you. I pray that God would give all of us this kind of spiritual heartburn. It's not a bad kind of heartburn. It's a healthy kind of heartburn. It's a heart that burns to know more about God. And then finally, number four, the one that uh, didn't make it to your bulletin. Next week, we're going to study the ascension of Jesus into heaven. And that will wrap up this part of the series. But the angels that were there with the disciples that day told the disciples that Jesus would return in the exact same way that he departed. He would come riding on the clouds. He would descend back down on Mount Zion when he returns, and he will. The question I have for you, and I want you to ponder this this week, are you going, when he returns, when Jesus returns, are you going to see his face, or are you going to see his back? If you see his face, that means you haven't been raptured and in heaven with him when the rapture occurs. If you see him coming face to face, that means he is bringing war on his enemies. Now, if you are going to see his back, that means you are a believer in Jesus, that you will have been raptured at that point and you will be returning with him. You understand what I mean? Jesus' second coming, he is coming to earth. But before that, he will come to the clouds to receive his bride unto himself. And that day is coming very, very soon. If you look at passages like Matthew 24, if you study the book of Daniel and Revelation, you will see that all of the things that Jesus himself listed that need to happen before his return are not only happening, but they are in re re increasing in intensity and scope. Everything that needs to happen for the return of Jesus is on the table right now. It's happening. I have some more resources for you if you'd like to look further into that, but the point that I'm making is we don't have a lot of time left to be reaching out to the lost in our world. And I'm not going to set a time because I don't know the time of the rapture. No one but the Father knows that time. But what I am saying is it's time to perk our ears up a little bit and pay attention. And I was reminded this morning, and I'm grateful for this reminder, even though it may not transition from our sermon very smoothly, I'm still grateful for it. Someone reminded me today, just because someone has grown up in a Christian home, with Christian parents does not automatically make them a Christian. You are not automatically a Christ follower if your mom and dad are, or if your grandparents are, or your aunt and uncles, or even your siblings. God does not have grandchildren. He only has children. Your parents don't get to make that decision for you. In fact, God himself doesn't even make that decision for you. You make that choice. So I wanted to challenge us this morning, and I, I guess this challenge goes out. I wish it could go out online, but that's okay too. Is your faith based in the fact that you go to church? Is your faith based in the fact that your parents believed in Jesus, or your family did, or your friends did? Or is your faith based on what you hear and what you know from your shepherd, Yeshua? Do you know the shalom 
of Yeshua, personally. If you don't, I'm going to give you an opportunity to change that right now. I'd like to lead you in a word of prayer, and if you have not considered accepting the Lord until today, then I'd like to lead you in that prayer. You can follow me in your heart or out loud. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I've done wrong things. And that has kept me separated from you. But on the cross, when you died, you took my sin and replaced it with your perfection. I want to thank you for that. And I accept your offer. I accept the Holy Spirit into my heart to guide my life. Thank you, Yeshua, for the shalom, the peace that only comes from you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Father, I want to thank you for each person here this morning. Thank you for giving us ears to understand and hearts to understand, minds to understand the things that you want us to hear. Help us as we go forward not to only have faith in the things that we see, but to trust the voice of our shepherd, the voice of Jesus. I pray that you would be blessed this morning, Father, above all else, that all credit and glory would go to you. Father, we love you, and we thank you so much, Jesus, for coming to make the sacrifice that you did and rising from the grave. Holy Spirit, we want to thank you for guiding us. We pray that you would be with us for the remainder of our week. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. And let's remember from John chapter 20, verse 29, blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Well, we did try a recording that this morning, so let's end the recording there.